spending his childhood and earning his undergraduate degree in the wilds of Georgia, <laughs> Jacob then moved uh, to Austin to pursue his PhD at the University of Texas. He is and remains the only PhD student of the AAS secretary, Fritz Benedict, who <laughs> co-advised him with Chris Sneedon. And after successfully doing a project on the metallicity of M dwarfs and their many wonderful attributes, he then uh, took a postdoc position at Göttingen in Germany, where he was awarded a Mary Curry Fellowship. Fortunately, at the end of that, he won a Sagan Fellowship, and we were able to attract him here to the Center for Astrophysics, where he remained but one year, a very successful year, and then started his faculty position at the University of Chicago. I have always found Jacob Bean to be very persuasive, and the HST TAC agree. <laughs> One of his many persuasive accomplishments has been uh, to convince them to award four days of observations to look at one exoplanet, <coughs> thus allowing the first of many exoplanet deep fields. I, uh, I'm really happy to have you back here, Jacob, and so I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Jacob Bean from the University of Chicago. I see the cone of light. Can everybody hear? Good afternoon. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, and wow, I, I am really excited to be here. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I did a postdoc position here. And like a lot of people, uh, that experience was really pivotal for my career. Uh, so I'm, I'm really honored to be back here three years later uh, to, with a chance to talk about some of the work uh, that I've been doing since starting my own group at the University of Chicago. Uh, so my talk today is going to be focused on exoplanet atmospheres. And so my talk, Exoplanets in HD, I hope uh, you'll come to understand what I mean by that as I, as I get going. Uh, but before I really get into things, I'd like to introduce uh, my group there, since I've only been doing this for a few years. I'm kind of like a new parent, and I want to show you pictures of my uh, <laughs> children in a way. Um, I'm really fortunate to work with a really uh, talented group of people, uh, uh, graduate students, Laura Kreidberg, Megan Medell, uh, even undergraduates. And I'll show a first author paper from my undergraduate, Hannah Diamond Lowe. Uh, she's going to be applying to grad school uh, later this year, so maybe you look out for that. Uh, Kevin Stevenson, a Sagan Fellow, uh, and Andreas Seifert, research scientist. I also show over here, of course, we have a, a number of external collaborators for the projects that I'm going to be uh, reporting on. And I just highlight in bold those who uh, are really uh, a CFA connection, either people that I met and started collaborating while I was here uh, or that are here already. So uh, Jean-Michel Dessert, I uh, shared an office with here. Uh, Zach Berta was a PhD student here, and of course, uh, Dave as well. So I'm going to begin uh, uh, the talk by sort of giving you the key points, uh, the main points that I'd like to make throughout this talk, and, and really three sort of simple points that I'd like to break it down. Uh, I'd like to convince you that uh, a major frontier right now in exoplanet uh, science is the characterization of exoplanets by studying their atmospheres. Uh, I think that's how we're going to understand the diversity of exoplanets that have been found by the many different surveys over the last few years, and how we're going to leverage the diversity of planets that we have found to further our understanding of planet phenomenology. Uh, we can do definitive atmospheric characterization today with some existing instruments. Uh, but it requires very high precision measurements to study exoplanet atmospheres. We're talking about signal-to-noise ratios of 30,000 or greater. Uh, and so with today's instruments, that requires intensive observational campaigns. And so that's really going to be the centerpiece of my talk, intensive observational campaigns, specifically with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, to study a few exoplanet atmospheres uh, as archetypes of the bigger sample of, of objects that we've seen. Uh, the good news towards the end is that uh, the exciting results that, it, that, it, that I hope you'll, you'll find exciting are really a preview of the really transformational science that we're going to be able to do <laughs> with future facilities that are coming online soon, hopefully. So the JWST and the GMT in particular. Okay, as you're probably all aware, there are now thousands of exoplanets that are known. Thousands of exoplanets and exoplanet candidates revealed by planet surveys. And so I just want to give you uh, a quick overview of the field uh, to motivate exoplanet atmosphere studies. 
Okay? And so this is just one single diagram that's, that, that summarizes an aspect of uh, the number of exoplanets that have been found. I'm just plotting here, planet mass is a function of orbital semi-major axis, and planets detected with multiple techniques, color-coded and uh, uh, with, with different symbols. So this is roughly 1,000 exoplanets uh, spread over many or orders of magnitude in terms of separations from their host stars and spanning uh, a wide range in masses. So the point I want to make is uh, we have a diversity of objects, a huge number of objects, and we want to understand these objects under the umbrella, so to say, of a complete theory of planets. Uh, planet formation, planetary physics. Uh, there are unexplored regions of parameter space, uh, and that certainly justifies new experiments and new uh, uh, instruments uh, to, do, uh, to explore that parameter space and find those planets. But I'm going to focus on atmospheric characterization of our typical objects in the parameter space that we already know of as representatives of different classes of planets that we've discovered so far. I really want to take some of these points on this figure, on this scatter plot, and turn them into worlds, because that's what planets are, right? Uh, I, came at, I came into this research area fascinated by the beautiful pictures of solar system planets uh, that we have. And so uh, part of my motivation is to turn these objects, points on a scatter plot, some of them at least, uh, into really worlds and think about them as planets. More specifically with atmospheric characterization, uh, I'd like to start answering two different kinds of questions. Uh, and these are related questions, but uh, what are they like? Where did they come from? So atmospheres mediate planetary energy budgets. They govern the incoming uh, irradiation from their host stars and outgoing uh, self-luminosity and re-radiation. Uh, we're fortunate to have exoplanets in a uh, very wide range of irradiations, re receiving a wide range of irradiations. So this gives us a chance to study planetary physics, planetary chemistry, and very different regimes from what we see in the solar system planets. Also, planetary atmospheres are a fossil record of planetary origins. We want to measure molecular and atomic abundances and connect those to the underlying elemental abundances to understand uh, planetary origins, planet formation, planetary evolution. So these are the two key questions that I keep in mind, sort of the overall uh, general questions. Uh, we want to measure planetary thermal structures to get at what planets are like, planetary compositions to understand where they came from. And of course, these things are related because the composition will have feedback effects to why planetary atmospheres have the thermal structure that they do, uh, but these are really the key questions that we're trying to answer. Now, I've been pursuing this topic of exoplanet atmospheres using uh, the transit technique, which was uh, definitely uh, something that's uh, big here at the Center for Astrophysics, but I want to emphasize here as a reminder the strengths and also the weaknesses of why we use transits to study planetary atmospheres. Uh, first of all, uh, one thing I haven't even listed here is simply that it's possible to study planetary atmospheres, which is a new thing as of about a decade ago. In particular, though, the strength of transit planet spectroscopy uh, is that you know the mass and radius of the planet. So that's a very powerful constraint on the atmospheric properties already before you've even taken a spectrum of the planet. Uh, we have multiple probes of the atmosphere, so that's something different, for example, than direct imaging. Uh, we can measure the uh, intrinsic emission from the planet. We can measure reflected light. We can also measure so-called transmission uh, spectrum, where the light from the host star filters through the upper atmosphere of the planet. Uh, we have the opportunity to study planets that are close into their stars. Those are not be planets that would be easily resolved uh, with direct imaging techniques, but are perfectly suited for transit techniques. And we want to study those planets because, as I said, they offer objects in a different region of parameter space than we're used to seeing in the solar system. There are some weaknesses of the technique, and it's worth, me worth mentioning uh, those as well. Uh, we measure planets relative to their stars, so we only know the planets as well as we know the stars. Uh, we also uh, have to make measurements uh, of the planets relative to the stars, so that's, that sets the level of precision that you have to get. It's not a question of achieving contrast, but it's a bec it becomes a question of achieving raw precision. We're limited, to the most part, to planets that are transiting, although this transiting spectroscopy sort of uh, 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 group of techniques has also been applied to non-transiting planets with time series approach. We're also limited to planets that are close into their stars. For example, it would be difficult to study the atmosphere of a true Earth analog using these transit techniques. Okay. So I'm going to be organizing the talk uh, by uh, using this as a, as a way to orient you throughout the talk. Uh, I'm going to be presenting results from two major Hubble Space Telescope programs, as Dave mentioned. I was lucky to be awarded a significant amount of time to pursue uh, these topics uh, with HST over uh, the previous two cycles. 
And normally I wouldn't tell you about the observing proposals or their names or how much time, but since these represent large programs that are uh, decided on by the greater uh, astronomical and planetary science communities, it's worth pointing out to you that these programs were approved and, to, and, and also to report the results. We're using a new instrument, or a relatively new instrument, that was installed in the latest uh, servicing mission. This is the Wide Field, uh, uh, wide field wait, with C3, Wide Field Camera 3. Uh, that was installed in the lattice servicing mission. We're also using this new technique known as spatial scanning. This is an example spectra that we take uh, during our observations. We slew the telescope in the spatial direction to smear out the spectrum on the detectors that allows us to achieve uh, very high duty cycles, even though we're looking at extremely bright stars. So this new instrument with C3 and this new observational capability are really the cornerstone of these new observational results that we're being able to get. Okay, so I'm going to start by presenting uh, published results that we have uh, from this first program, a, a Cycle 20 large program, where we dedicated 60 orbits of observational time uh, to a single exoplanet, as Dave mentioned. Uh, so to orient you, we're talking now about measuring exoplanet transmission spectra. So when the planet passes in front of the star, we see some of the starlight filter through the upper part of the planet's atmosphere. The planet appears larger at wavelengths where you have absorption due to molecular atomic species high in the planet's atmospheres, and it appears smaller outside those wavelengths where you have significant opacity. So we're measuring basically the size of the planet as a function of wavelength to deduce this so-called transmission spectrum. The program that I'm going to be presenting was focused on super-Earth type planets and using observations of at least one super-Earth to try to understand the diversity of super-Earths uh, that had been revealed uh, recently. I'm showing here uh, the mass radius diagram uh, for low mass planets as it stands today. Uh, there are about 12 objects on this diagram. Super Earths are defined as objects between masses of 2 and 10 times the mass of the Earth. This is a really new kind of planet population that's only emerged recently. Of course we don't have any of these objects in our own solar system, but remarkably uh, the Kepler mission and also radio velocity surveys have revealed that they are perhaps the most common kinds of exoplanet around, in short period orbits at least, uh, around solar type stars. And here's just an example of one of the many uh, results in terms of planet frequency as a function of now planet size, uh, but this is really the super Earth regime here, uh, somewhere between 1.5 to 2.8 Earth radii. You can see that these objects are extremely common. Uh, tens of percents of solar-like stars have short period super Earths. Looking at the mass radius diagram, uh, you can infer a little bit about the composition of these objects. I've put theoretical models for different compositions as lines on this diagram. So hydrogen, uh, water, ice, silicate like the Earth, and iron. And you can see that the density of these objects, the different radii as a function of mass for these objects, imply a wide diversity in composition. However, just knowing the mass and radius of these objects, as important as that is, doesn't tell us exactly what these objects are made out of. And so atmospheric characterization gives us the chance to peer into these objects and learn more about what they're made out of. How thick are their atmospheres? What's the dominant constituent of their atmospheres? Are these atmospheres uh, primary atmospheres that were accreted from the protoplanetary uh, nebula? Or are they secondary atmospheres that were outgassed, for example? These are the kind of questions we like to be able to answer for these planets. And atmospheric characterization is really the key to doing that. Once you have the mass and radius of the object, the, the atmosphere is the next thing that you can study. So uh, we put a lot of effort into studying this planet GJ1214b, which was actually found by Dave Charbonneau's MIRTH project here. Uh, and it turns out that uh, that survey is, of course, very well designed to find planets that are great for studying the atmospheres. Uh, the planet orbits a small star, and for transit observations, that's very beneficial. Uh, it's also a relatively bright star in the infrared, uh, where we like to do our uh, planetary uh, spectroscopy. And so we studied this object really as a case study for what we can learn about the compositions of these new uh, and mysterious super-Earth type planets uh, by studying their atmospheres. So this is an example of theoretical models that we expect uh, for planets measured in transmission. We're plotting here the transit depth as a function of wavelength and the lines here are different models which I'll explain in a second. The key thing to recognize from a transmission spectrum is that the planet appears larger at wavelengths where you have significant opacity. So the plot is reversed from what you would normally see. Absorption uh, implies a larger planet, and that's up in this diagram. So you can see in the infrared you expect uh, uh, molecular features, water, CO2, ammonia, uh, methane would be on here as well. There it is. 
Uh, and so here are theoretical models that were published for GJ1214b uh, following the discovery of the object with different scenarios of what the atmosphere would be made out of. And so really two classes of atmospheres emerged from this theoretical modeling uh, when the planet was discovered. Uh, and these atmospheres are, could be described simply as uh, hydrogen-rich type atmospheres, that is, uh, a planet with an atmosphere that was accreted from the pro protoplanetary disk, uh, and also uh, another category of atmospheres that are so-called metal-rich atmospheres, perhaps dominated by heavy molecules like water or even CO2. Uh, these atmospheres uh, could have arisen because you had a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere that was uh, suffered photoevaporation and lost hydrogen to space, leaving only heavier molecules, or this kind of atmosphere could be a secondary atmosphere that was formed via uh, uh, sublimation of ices uh, as the planet formed probably beyond the snow line and migrated inward to its current place very close to its host star and relatively hot. The key thing to take away from this figure is the sensitivity of transmission spectroscopy to this thing, the scale height of the atmosphere, so the E-folding scale of the pressure in the atmosphere, which is primarily for a given planet sensitive to this mean molecular weight term. So that represents uh, what's the dominant component of the atmosphere? Is it a light molecule like uh, molecular hydrogen, or is it a heavy molecule like water or CO2? So that's, that explains the two different classes of models that you see in this diagram. A uh, class of models for hydrogen-dominated atmospheres with large, relatively large features expected in transmission, and those class of models with relatively small features expected in transmission, purely because this size of the features in transmission data scales linearly with the scale height and inversely proportional to this mean molecular weight. So this is the idea. We're leveraging this unique sensitivity of transmission spectroscopy to the dominant composition of the planet's atmosphere. Uh, back in 2010, I sort of got kind of lucky and was able to make the first uh, measurements of this planet's atmosphere. And there were a number of measurements over subsequent years uh, building up uh, a, a very impressive uh, uh, transmission spectrum uh, of the planet covering from the optical out to the infrared. What emerged from these data, and there's a lot of scatter here, but if you take the most precise data and compare it to the theoretical models, you see that you don't observe the strong absorption features you expect for hydrogen-dominated atmospheres. These atmospheres would be very puffy. They present a large cross-section for absorption when the planet passes in front of the star. That's the gray line here. And the most precise data uh, taken together ruled that out at very high confidence. However, we didn't really know the composition of the planet's atmosphere based on these observations. I said, you can reduce the size of features in transmission spectra by increasing the mean molecular weight. And so you might say, since you don't see large features, increase the mean molecular weight. There's a complication, though, and that complication is the uh, possible presence of clouds in the upper part of the planet's atmosphere, simply truncating the, the, the passage of the stellar light through the planet's atmosphere at some altitude and giving the same kind of so-called featureless or flat spectrum. So we were motivated to do a more intensive study of this planet uh, to maybe to distinguish between those competing scenarios, whether there's some sort of cloud that's blocking our view to the lower atmosphere, or really this is a fundamentally new kind of atmosphere, a high mean molecular, high mean molecular weight atmosphere, perhaps dominated by water vapor. Um, and the point being that the, fe the spectrum underlying high mean molecular weight atmosphere is not flat. It simply has muted features. You need to increase the precision to see those features. And so we set about doing that using uh, WIFC3 on, on HST, uh, and in particular, combining four uh, total days of observing time uh, to study this planet, an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented 15 transits of the object to build up a very precise transmission spectrum. So here are example light curves, and these are probably the last light curves that I'll show in this talk. But this is really what we're doing, is we're measuring the transit light curve as a function of wavelength. So this is from 1.1 to 1.7 micron. Uh, we're measuring this at very high precision. We're getting precisions of roughly uh, 80 parts per million per exposure, 650 total exposures uh, to build up uh, these light curves. And so returning to the, the state of uh, the situation before we made our measurements, here are the most precise data sets. You can see that hydrogen-dominated or solar composition gas atmospheres are ruled out. That's the gold line. But the data were consistent with the small features expected by, for example, 100% water vapor atmosphere. Now with the new measurements, and I'm going to zoom in on the y-axis by a factor of 10, here are the new measurements. And so we reach a precision of 30 parts per million in our spectroscopic channels at R of uh, uh, 70. Uh, and unfortunately, we still see that the spectrum is featureless. 
But that's a very powerful thing because that allows us to definitively distinguish between these competing scenarios for the planet. I'm going to switch over now showing both figures. Here are the old data. The scale is running from minus 1500 to plus 1500 ppm and now we zoom in by a factor of 10 by, uh, to see uh, the precision that we've reached in the new data. The blue line is the same in both of those figures, excuse me, and you can see that we would have easily detected the spectral features of a water-dominated atmosphere for this planet, and we don't see those. And indeed, we were able to rule out water-dominated uh, atmospheres at 16 sigma confidence. And we're also able to rule out a whole host of other high mean molecular weight uh, composition atmospheres for this planet. So what this means is that the planet's atmosphere must host clouds in its, in its upper part of its atmosphere. Um, we don't know if it truly is a fundamentally different kind of atmosphere. We don't know if it's really 100% water, but we can say with, the, you know, with certainty that it must host clouds. And some uh, really great modeling done by collaborator Bjorn Benecke uh, sort of quantifies the altitude at which we expect these clouds. Uh, we're showing here uh, chi-square space is a function of pressure uh, and water mole fraction or mean molecular weight, however you want to read it. Uh, trace water abundance is this side. Uh, dominant, dominated by water is on this side. And so you can see here, this is the region of uh, one sigma uh, fit to the data, and the pressures here involved for a gray uh, opacity that cuts off transmission to lower altitudes is at very low pressures. This is, these units are in millibar. So 0.1 millibar and perhaps even lower pressure, higher altitudes than the planet are required. You might say, well, why is this an exciting result? Well, there's two things that make it exciting. First is a definitive statement about a super-Earth atmosphere, resolving this open question about why the previous transmission spectroscopy measurements for this planet gave this flat spectrum. And also because it brings up a mystery of its own. We have theoretical predictions for cloud species and the altitudes at which clouds should be in planetary atmospheres. And so I'm showing here uh, a plot of pressure versus temperature uh, where we compare temperature pressure profiles and different flavors here in black uh, solid line and dashed line to the predictions of condensation curves for different chemical species. So the point is wherever this temperature pressure profile crosses the condensation curves, the colored dashed lines, is where you expect the cloud base to be uh, for that chemical species. And so for GJ1214b, uh, the temperature pressure profiles that we calculate cross the condensation curves of exotic species like calcium chloride and zinc sulfide, uh, but it happens at very low altitudes, relatively low altitudes compared to where we're sensitive to with our transmission spectroscopy. If you recall from the previous diagram, we needed to be at pressures of about 0.1 millibar or lower. So the point is the predictions of where clouds will form from known chemical species and known cloud formation processes have the cloud base at quite low altitudes, whereas we need the clouds at much lower pressures and higher altitudes. And so it's an open question whether uh, you can form these kinds of clouds and loft them to high enough altitude uh, to cause this transmission spectrum to be simply cut off and truncated. Um, previous results suggested that that would require uh, very vigorous mixing uh, to reproduce the, the existing data, but now that we've improved the precision so much and have even tighter constraints on the pressure level of the clouds, it remains to be seen whether that's something that's feasible for these equilibrium condensates to be lofted uh, to the high enough altitude. From my own point of view, when we first obtained this result, I thought the most likely explanation was some sort of photochemically produced haze in the upper part of the atmosphere. And so, by analogy, the classic example for photochemical haze is the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan. So just showing some pictures here. But very recently, there's been some uh, really nice work done by Tyler Robinson collaborators where they've used Cassini to effectively measure a transmission spectrum of Titan as you would see it as an exoplanet. And so here's the similar kind of plot. Transmission is a function of wavelength. Up is, again, absorption. And for at least in the case of Titan, you expect relatively large uh, absorption features on top of the photochemical haze continuum. Uh, scattering continuum there. Um, so obviously something like Titan is not going to be exactly what we expect on this planet GJ1214b, uh, but it remains to be seen whether uh, you could have equilibrium condensation or photochemically produced haze uh, causing, uh, explaining the data that we've obtained for that planet. Okay, so I'm going to change gears now uh, and talk not about super-Earths and particularly small exoplanets, but 
my own natural evolution in this field led me to uh, next study uh, giant exoplanets. And so in the next cycle, we propose for an intensive observational campaign to study uh, giant exoplanet atmospheres. And so I'm going to report now on that. But to give you the groundwork for why I felt like it was in a way going, you might say, well, this is maybe in a way going backwards because we started at super Earths and we should go to smaller and cooler planets because ultimately we want to study the Earth. Uh, but uh, to give you a, a, an understanding of why I felt like it was necessary to back up a little bit uh, and study giant planets, uh, and in particular to use this intensive observational campaign to obtain high precision data to make definitive statements. And so I want to just talk very briefly about some exciting uh, previous but low confidence results for giant exoplanets. Uh, one particular result concerned the thermal structure of giant exoplanet atmospheres, in particular these hot Jupiter uh, atmospheres. Hot Jupiters are the easiest planets to study the atmospheres of, uh, easiest exoplanets to study the atmospheres of. So this should be really the cornerstone of our knowledge of exoplanetary atmospheres is what we know about hot Jupiters. Uh, and I won't belabor this, this plot too much, just to say that here we're showing, uh, these are uh, photometric, now this is not spectroscopy, but broadband photometry points taken at secondary eclipse where you're seeing the thermal emission of the planet as a function of wavelength. The point being that this rise uh, uh, in, in the increased secondary eclipse depth, the brighter appearance of the planet at these wavelengths indicated that the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere wasn't a classical decrease in temperature with pressure, but that there was a so-called thermal inversion, where you decrease temperature with pressure up until a point where the temperature actually began to increase again before decreasing. So the thermal inversion. Actually, all exoplanet, all plants, uh, all of the objects in the solar system with uh, substantial atmospheres have thermal inversions. So this wasn't a crazy thing to see on an exoplanet. But it does imply something uh, happening uh, chemically in the planet's atmosphere that was somewhat unexpected, because the whole point of this is you have to have some high altitude absorber that's absorbing that incoming starlight uh, and re-radiating and warming the atmosphere. So this was the canonical result for HD 209458b, where they saw the thermal inversion. However, uh, my student, uh, Hannah Diamond Lowe, reanalyzed the previous uh, Spitzer, uh, these data, the previous data were from Spitzer, broadband photometry, and also analyzed new data for this planet and found that the uh, new analysis doesn't support the conclusion of a thermal inversion in this planet. And so people spent a lot of effort looking for thermal inversions in other planets and trying to understand the origin of thermal inversions of these kinds of planets. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like the original object that that, 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 that generated this, this excitement and this interest turns out likely not to have a thermal inversion. And just to give you an example, this is one of the old broadband points and this is how much it changed with the new analysis. So a very su substantial change in the values. The previous, a fit to the previous data is shown here in blue where you have this thermal inversion so temperature is going down that way and pressure is going down that way. So at higher altitudes temperature decreases and then this turnover is the thermal inversion. Instead what we derive is a classical temperature pressure profile with a simply monotonically decreasing temperature with pressure. This is the kind of thing that we wanted to investigate. Furthermore, this is something I think some people in the audience, uh, especially the, the, the disk and planet formation people have gotten excited about, is this possibility of unusual elemental uh, abundance patterns in planetary atmospheres as uh, indicator of unusual planet formation or planetary evolutionary processes. In particular, the carbon to oxygen ratio uh, for hot Jupiters. Some of them have been shown to possibly be strongly non-solar, implying actually uh, more abundant carbon in these planets' atmospheres than oxygen, which is contrary to the solar abundance pattern. The original object for uh, this whole uh, area of, of investigation was this planet, this hot Jupiter known as WAS-12b. Original study was by uh, Niku Matasuda, and I'm sorry this is cut off. That was back in 2011. Uh, again, looking at the thermal emission of the planet, uh, we've uh, also reanalyzed and, and, and studied uh, this object as a, with a comprehensive study of, of all the data that were available uh, up until recently, where the original data, the original inference, inference of a high C to O ratio was based on a few broadband photometry points. Now we've added spectroscopy and there's been a few other measurements of, of photometry. We found that this result actually holds up. Uh, it's still uh, a valid thing. The, the best fit to all the data is still a high carbon to oxygen ratio atmosphere. But I want to point out that the inference really hinges on a single broadband photometry point that's inconsistent with uh, just fitting a black body to this. 
Okay, and so while the data do point to a high C to O ratio, this is not a spectroscopic confirmation of an abundance pattern that's unusual. It's one broadband phot photometry point that's off by it's off by about seven sigma, so it's a significant result, but it's still not an unambiguous detection of a high C to O ratio from my point of view. Uh, furthermore, we're interested in investigating this question of water abundances in giant planet atmospheres. This is a question that we could actually answer for giant exoplanets maybe more easily than we can answer it for planets in our own solar system. You may not know, but it's interesting to point out that the oxygen abundance in Jupiter is very poorly known. And if we think that uh, giant planets form via core accretion, and that starts with uh, uh, condensation, uh, and that whole snow line argument, then oxygen is obviously going to be a critical ingredient to this because oxygen you know, condenses out as water. Oxygen is the third most abundant element cosmologically, uh, so that should be an important part of giant planet formation. Here I'm showing measurements of the elemental abundance uh, in Jupiter's atmospheres from a, different, uh, from a number of different uh, measurements, but the ones I want to highlight are the ones from the Galileo entry probe. So this is an in situ measurement of the elemental abundance in Jupiter's atmosphere. And a lot of the elements show the classical two to four times solar enhancement in elemental abundances consistent with core accretion model for giant planet formation. The problem is, is that the water abundance uh, is subsolar, and not just subsolar, but also uh, significantly lower than the other elements. And so that's brought up the question of whether uh, uh, Jupiter formed uh, from uh, carbon rich planetesimals rather than oxygen rich planetesimals. Uh, and so this is a real question. Now, the problem with the Galileo probe entry is that it entered a so-called hotspot in Jupiter's atmosphere, and that oxygen abundance they measure via water could be affected by uh, local meteor meteorological conditions. And so this is only considered, or this is broadly considered, a lower limit. The point being that water, which is the carrier of oxygen in Jupiter's atmosphere, uh, Jupiter's atmosphere is quite cold. So that, that water has condensed out into uh, parts of Jupiter's atmosphere that are harder to observe. Hot Jupiters, these giant exoplanets that are highly irradiated, uh, should have water in the gas form in the observable part of the atmosphere. And it should be straightforward to measure that and convert that measured water abundance into the underlying oxygen abundance. So this is the, the questions that we were wanting to tackle in this next Hubble Space Telescope program using intensive observational campaigns. And so we were moving from, uh, we're again talking about transmission spectroscopy, and now I'm talking about new results. Uh, these are preliminary results for this planet WAS-12, which you might recall from just a few moments ago, was the canonical object with a non-solar carbon to oxygen elemental abundance ratio. This is a measure of transmission spectrum, and just to show you that we actually detect molecular absorption features with these techniques, uh, here is a very strong detection of water. Uh, when, I, when I quote uh, the confidence on the detection of these molecules, I'm not talking about simply the size of the bump relative to some zero point, but absolute, actually the um, unambiguous identification of that molecule. Not just that we see a six sigma bump, but also that it is six sigma confident that that's water and not some other combination of molecules. Uh, so we have a six sigma detection of water in this planet, and this is the first spectroscopic identification of a molecule in this planet's atmosphere. And the original paper with a high C to O ratio has more than 100 citations. So that kind of gives you the state of play here. Um, so now that we've measured water, uh, we can try to measure actually the abundance of water and see if that's consistent with this picture of high C to O uh, uh, ratio. And transmission spectroscopy is not super good at measuring very precise molecular abundances. But we do get a result, and we can compare it uh, to predictions. So I'm showing here our measurement uh, of the water abundance mixing ratio. This is a log scale as a function of temperature. And I'm showing as a function of temperature because the predictions of molecular abundances in planetary atmospheres depends on the temperature, also the pressure. So there are three uh, families of curves here that I'll now illustrate. Uh, the solid line is solar metallicity, solar C to O, so solar abundance pattern, at different pressures. The pressures uh, we probe in transmission are not quite certain uh, with these data, so we, we calculate these equilibrium models at different pressures. We also calculate 10 times solar metallicity, again, solar C to O, that's this uh, dash dotted. And then most interesting for comparison with our measurement is the family of models with solar metallicity, but this high C to O ratio, these dashed lines. Uh, and so you can see some uh, tension between our measurement of the water abundance for this temperature and the predictions of the water abundance uh, for high C to O atmosphere. And so this is about three sigma tension uh, with the predictions.
so this is not a definitive uh, contradiction of the high C to O ratio, but it is definitely evidence kind of pointing away from that. Moving on from our transmission spectroscopy measurements, we're also doing emission spectroscopy. So that is, I've said a little bit about this already, but I want to emphasize uh, when the planet passes behind the star, you see the light from the star, the light from the planet that's blocked. If you're observing in the optical, that might be reflected light. We're observing in the infrared where this is purely thermal emission, the intrinsic thermal emission from the planet. Now we're trying to answer this question about water abundance and trying to do it at, more, at higher precision. We're also looking, about the, looking into the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere to get at planetary uh, physics and chemistry in this new regime of irradiated planetary atmospheres. Uh, so here's an emission spectrum of another hot Jupiter, uh, sort of kind of random hot Jupiter that was selected primarily because of its observability, WASP-43b. What you're seeing here is uh, the absorption of, of water superimposed on the emission spectrum of the planet. Uh, we get a seven sigma detection of water absorption uh, just from our uh, HST data. There are also existing Spitzer broadband photometry points at longer wavelengths that we incorporate in our analysis that firms up our detection of water from seven to 11 sigma and allows us to derive a very precise uh, water abundance from these data. Uh, we also ended up getting transmission spectroscopy measurements uh, for the same planet. And so here's the transmission spectrum, which hopefully you're now starting to become familiar with. This is the absorption signature of water uh, at five sigma confidence and a derived water abundance uh, for that as well. The key being here, we're trying to obtain a robust measurement, robust in terms of uh, uh, based on high precision spectroscopy and based on multiple indicators. So emission spectroscopy and transmission spectroscopy, which probe different parts of the planet, different uh, pressure levels in the atmosphere. Here's a histogram now of the water abundance converted to what we expect for a solar composition gas. Uh, frequency, uh, uh, this is basically the posterior distribution of the water abundances for the transmission data and for the emission data. We expect the water abundance to be fairly consistent uh, across the uh, parts of the planet that we're probing with these observations. So we combine them together uh, to give a measurement uh, that I'm highlighting here. We're taking a measured water volume mixing ratio we're assuming the solar abundance pattern and converting that to the underlying elemental abundance of oxygen. Uh, and what we find is this oxygen abundance uh, is 0.4 to 3.5 times solar. And I highlight that was with an exclamation point because remember how very uncertain the oxygen abundance is for Jupiter. Uh, there's a measurement that's much lower than expected. They blame that on local uh, meteorological effects. We simply don't even know the oxygen abundance for the other giant planets in the solar system uh, because they're even colder than Jupiter. So it's even harder, and we haven't had an in situ uh, probe. Uh, so here we have, you know, for the first time, uh, a robust measurement of the oxygen abundance in a giant planet, and it turns out to be an exoplanet. Uh, one thing we've done that's uh, interesting is, is to try to do comparative planetology now between this exoplanet, uh, which turns out to have uh, a mass two times the mass of Jupiter. So there's been a lot of talk in the field of exoplanets about super-Earths, and I kind of made this, this point myself, being very interesting because this is a region of planet parameters where we haven't seen, we don't have those kinds of planets in our own solar system. I also want to highlight that giant exoplanets, exoplanets more massive than Jupiter, are also somewhat unusual objects. Their frequency is not as high as super-Earths, but again, this is an outcome of planet formation uh, that exists out there in the galaxy, in the universe, uh, but we don't have in our own solar system. And so we're doing comparative planetology by trying to compare the metallicity that we infer for this planet with the metallicities that we have for the solar system giant planets. And I highlight that the metallicity for the solar system planets is estimated via the carbon abundance due to uh, methane spectroscopy. Uh, and for WASP-43, we measure oxygen via the water abundance. So one thing that's well known for the solar system planets is this uh, uh, increasing metallicity to lower planet masses reflecting the, uh, probably the accretion of nebular gas as a function of planetary mass and the formation of these objects. And so very interestingly, although you know, with somewhat lower confidence as a big error bar, uh, WASP-43b does extend the trend that we get when we fit a power law, this is log-log space, uh, to the uh, measurements for the solar system. Uh, so this is an interesting you know, new result. I'm not claiming this is any sort of definitive measurement of metallicity, but I, I think this points the way towards the future of what we'd like to do. The strength of exoplanets is that we have a diversity of objects. We see objects in different physical regimes, uh, and we can measure 
uh, now that we've established that this is a robust measurement technique by, by doing different probes of the planet's atmosphere, doing high precision spectroscopy, having very high confidence uh, molecular detections, uh, now we might be able to start populating this diagram uh, with measurements for other exoplanets. I also want to talk about a new kind of observation that we've done with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and that's to not just look at the thermal emission of an exoplanet at, at secondary eclipse when it passes behind its host star, but also uh, looking at the thermal emission variations as the planet orbits its star. The point being for these very short period planets, they're tidally locked, and so one orbital period is one rotation period. If you observe the planet through a, a full orbit, uh, f through one complete orbit, you see one full rotation of the planet. And since it's tidally locked, there should be a hot side and a, not, and a cold side. Uh, the new thing that we've done is to do this with spectroscopic techniques. There have been previous so-called phase curve measurements in broadband photometry that have given us very exciting results uh, about constraints on uh, energy redistribution from hot day sides to cold night sides. But we want to precisely measure the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere. And we need to do that, we have to break the degeneracy between the composition of the planet's atmosphere and the temperature pressure profile. And that can only be done, that's me. Uh, with <laughs> spectroscopic techniques, the point being that you use a molecular absorption feature to sort of vertically scan the, the planet's uh, temperature profile. And so for the first time, we've done phase-resolve spectroscopy for an exoplanet. Uh, and we did this using the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm showing here, first of all, simply the white light measurement of the phase variations to emphasize how strongly we've been able to make the detection of the signal for this planet. This is where we just sum all the light together uh, in our spectra to make a single broadband photometry point. Uh, so this is 41 HST orbits over uh, three days. The orbital period of this planet is about 0.8 days. So over three uh, nearly consecutive days of the planet, we, we spent 31 uh, HST orbits uh, to measure this. The point being that there had never been, to my knowledge, repeat observations of phase curves uh, in broadband photometry and we're doing spectroscopy now, and we're doing it also three times to ensure that we get a very high precision, very robust result. So you see here, this inset shows the transit, which is off the scale on the main figure. This is a 3% transit dip, okay, so it's a large planet relative to the star, so that's very easily detected. This is not the transit, that's the secondary eclipse, uh, which has a depth of 400 parts per million, detected at very high confidence. And then this sort of sinusoidal shape is the phase variation of the planet. Uh, at secondary eclipse, you're seeing the hot day side. Half an orbital phase, phase layer, you're seeing the colder night side. And we confirm, indeed, that there is a hot day side and a cold night side. This planet has very inefficient redistribution of energy from the day side to the night side. We detect an asymmetry in the curve. Uh, so the, hot, the hottest part of the planet is not the substellar point. It's actually uh, downwind, or what we think of as downwind uh, from the substellar point, showing that there is energy being redistributed from the day side to the night side. This hot spot offset is characteristic of that sort of energy redistribution. But really the key here was that we measured some spectroscopic, we obtained spectroscopy for this planet. and allows us to invert uh, the emission spectra that we get into uh, thermal profiles for the planet's atmosphere. So I'm going to show a movie, if I, can get, if I can find my mouse cursor. The best way to visualize this we found was uh, just to turn it into a movie. So here it is. The top left shows the emission spectrum of the planet. Uh, and as the movie plays, you're seeing the emission spectrum of the planet uh, as a function of a rotational phase uh, on the planet. And so what you're seeing is the absorption band of water. There's marked. You see the cold night side rotating into view. And then as it comes back up, the hotter day side of the planet. Um, using uh, this molecular feature to scan the vertical structure of the planet's atmosphere, uh, we can fit temperature pressure profiles to the different emission spectra that we obtain as a function of phase, and we resolve the temperature pressure pro profile uh, fully around the planet now, uh, based on these observations. Uh, because we can break the degeneracy between composition and thermal structure, the power of spectroscopy. And just for illustration purposes, we show uh, some brightness temperature maps of the planet. We don't have any uh, latitudinal information, so that's just an extrapolation, but I think it's visually appealing to, to, to see how uh, you decompose the brightness uh, temperature as a function of wavelength. This is outside the water band, in the water band, outside the water band. Oops. And showing how it's, it's, it's kind of hard to see in the movie, but this, the shuttle, the, the subtle shape of the, well, whatever, you've seen it, right? 
So there it is, the first phase resolved spectroscopy where we've created this, uh, this, this map of the thermal structure of an exoplanet atmosphere. And so we're using these data to confront uh, theoretical models about how energy is absorbed and, er, and circulated and re-emitted uh, in planetary atmospheres at a new level of detail. And I'm just showing here an example plot from a general circulation model uh, calculated by uh, Tiffany Kataria, a graduate student working with Adam Schoeman at the University of Arizona, where they've simulated uh, the expectation for the thermal structure of the planet's atmosphere. This is a cut in pressure showing the map uh, at uh, basically 0.1 bar, the temperature as a function of latitude and longitude. Uh, and I will just say, I don't have a figure for this yet because this is the paper in preparation. Work's not quite complete. But the uh, prediction of the offset and the hot spot uh, in terms of degrees uh, from their untuned model matches very well the observations. So that's really exciting. Their prediction for the day side emission spectrum uh, from this 3D GCM model also matches very well, which is different from what you see from 1D models. Um, and another thing that we've, we've measured from these data, and I'm sorry this figure is it's not so great. This is, this is a new kind of observation, so we're just learning how uh, to interpret and making these figures as we go and, and trying to figure out what's the important thing we can extract. Here we're showing the offset in that hot spot now as a function of altitude or pressure in the planet's atmosphere. And so uh, for the first time we've seen evidence for uh, a, a pressure variation in that hot spot offset. The conventional uh, explanation for hot spots and how much they're shifted relative to the substellar point is this competition between uh, advective energy transport time scale and, and radiative, energy, uh, radiative uh, time scale. So the point being at lower pressures, the radiative time scale is shorter. Uh, the energy there should be re-rated very quickly before it can be redistributed uh, to a different part of the planet's atmosphere. So that's exactly what we see at low pressure. We have a relatively low hot spot offset. And as you go to deeper pressures where the evective time scale becomes more dominant over the radiative time scale, you have a hint that the peak, uh, the offset, the hot spot offset uh, is larger. Uh, those are probably outliers, the light curves at those wavelengths, <laughs> the probe by those wavelengths. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, are a little, a little messy. And so statistically speaking, those are also outliers. Uh, but it won't change very much if you include those because the error bars are large and you're dominated by these points in this region. So this is, this is something more on the cutting edge of uh, maybe we're pushing the boat out a little bit here. Uh, but this is the thing that we like to do, is measure the thermal emission of these planets, determine the thermal structure, and confront uh, models for planetary atmospheres in this new regime, highly radiated regime. OK, so I'm going to wrap up uh, soon. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up by talking a little bit about my vision for where this area is, should be going in the future. Uh, we've, with Hubble Space Telescope, we have the capability to do very precise exoplanet atmosphere spectroscopy centered around a water absorption band. And so I think that's a very powerful capability. And we'd like to take advantage of the opportunities offered by exoplanets by studying a diverse range of objects. The truth is we're never going to have as precise and a detailed knowledge about exoplanet atmospheres as we will for the atmospheres of the solar system planets. The thing that we have the, the opportunity to do with exoplanets is study a diverse range of objects, uh, perhaps at lower precision and with less confidence, but to leverage statistical studies. And so in the short term, I think we should use the Hubble Space Telescope to study the uh, water abundance as a proxy for metallicity of planets with a range of masses. We want to study the thermal structures of, of planet, planetary atmospheres as a function of irradiation and surface gravity. The presence of clouds, again, is a function of temperature and surface gravity. In the future, we look forward to facilities like the James Webb Space Telescope and the Giant Magellan Telescope that will give us access to a wider range of wavelengths that will allow us to study the abundances of other molecules and ultimately try to take the full inventory of the elemental abundances in these planets' atmospheres and to study the thermal structures of planets that are cooler than these hot Jupiters that we've been focusing on. Of course, the deeper question is, uh, and what we're really driving at, the original motivation for a lot of exoplanet atmosphere studies is to say if any of the small and cool planets that are starting to be discovered in the habitable zones of stars are actually habitable. So exoplanet planetary atmosphere is, of course, a key part of habitability in uh, determining whether a planet's habitable and then allowing us to diagnose whether a planet's habitable. And so I just want to show, uh, give you a sense about how far we are from doing observations and measurements that are interesting from that standpoint. So I'm showing here uh, measurements, for example, of a um, 
uh, these are the measurements that we obtained for GJ1214b. So these are the real data that we obtained compared to models for the planet with an Earth-like atmosphere. An Earth-like only meaning composition. So nitrogen dominated with trace other molecules. Where you expect, if you have a trace of water given the transit geometry, you expect actually quite a large signal. So this is a nitrogen dominated atmosphere. It's a lot harder than the Earth's atmosphere. But you can see with our 30 parts per million spectroscopy, uh, we're a we would be able to see that Earth-like atmosphere around GJ1214b, or Earth similar to Earth. If we take the precision in our measurements and don't even increase the resolving power and just go from 30 to 10 parts per million and take the planet, shrink it to the size of the Earth, and cool it to 300 Kelvin, uh, this is what you would get. So this is the kind of measurement we might be able to obtain with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so you would actually be able to detect the atmosphere, nitrogen-rich atmosphere with trace water, uh, if you can push the precision to that level. Uh, so uh, this is the key part of this, though, is uh, increasing the precision, of course, but it's uh, something more subtle, which is the kind of star that this planet is orbiting. So that's the thing that I uh, kept the same. GJ1214b, we're able to use a certain level of precision and study a super-Earth. That's because that planet is orbiting a very small star. And it actually goes as the square of the size of this host star, your sensitivity to atmospheric features. And so if you take that same uh, Earth-sized planet and put it around a G star, uh, this changes dramatically. Instead of 10 parts per million, you'd need a uh, factor of 25 better to see the same kind of planet. And so uh, looking forward, if we want to use the James Webb Space Telescope and the GMT to study uh, potentially habitable planets that are Earth's size, we need to find those planets around M dwarfs. Those are the planets we can use these transit techniques to study the atmospheres of. And actually, uh, this roadmap is kind of obvious, uh, but there's still uh, uh, things standing in our way of doing this. And the real big thing is that we have to be able to find those planets in the first place. We're going to launch James Webb Space Telescope, and we're going to use it for exoplanet atmosphere studies. Uh, but we need the objects to study if we're talking about habitable planets. And so uh, a key aspect of this transit spectroscopy science is that we have first found transiting planets. Where we're in good shape there, because with the extension of the Kepler mission to K2, uh, the approval of the TESS mission, uh, the uh, expansion of the MERS survey into the southern hemisphere, we're on a good footing in terms of finding transiting planets. But what we don't have is the ability to confirm and measure the masses of those planets with Doppler spectroscopy. And so uh, one of the other things that my group at the University of Chicago is doing uh, is instrumentation. And uh, some of you in the audience may have even used uh, our first instrument that we built, LDSS-3C, a new detector system uh, for one of the instruments of Magellan. Uh, with that success, we'd like to move on to building a full-scale instrument uh, ourselves. And so the thing that we'd like to do is build an optimized radio velocity spectrograph uh, for M dwarfs with this science case in mind, uh, confirming and measuring the masses of small habitable zone planets around nearby M stars, those planets that we could study with the GMT and the James Webb Space Telescope. And so this is our concept for the instrument Maroon X. This is a slight description. I won't go into it. Uh, it's uh, definitely a question of money. We have about a quarter of the funds that we need to build this instrument. Um, and if you're sitting on an instrument review panel in the near future and you see this proposal, maybe you'll <laughs> think it's cool. And I want to wrap up with this final slide. Ultimately, we're working towards uh, instrumentation, radio velocity instrumentation on the Giant Magellan Telescope. And that's really critical because uh, that will expand our uh, radio velocity identification of Earth sized planets in the habitable zone from M dwarfs now to G dwarfs. And I haven't talked a lot about direct imaging, but suffice it to say that in the long run, true Earth twins are only going to be studied with direct imaging, probably with a flagship mission in space. Uh, from the ground, uh, we, there's a really key role that radio velocities can play in that program, and that's identifying the nearest objects, uh, nearest Earth twin objects, so that we would know where to point a terrestrial planet finder mission at. And so I want to highlight uh, this instrument called GCLEF, which is actually being led here at the uh, Center for Astrophysics. Uh, it has been selected for first light, but those of you following the GMT project probably aware of a lot of permutations happening to the project, and so nothing is ever certain until it's actually built, right, Andy? Uh, and so I just want to, I just want to, I just want to make sure that I promote this concept uh, regularly, so that we make sure that we have the right instrumentation for first light on the GMT to do really transformational science in the field of exoplanets. Uh, with that, I say thanks uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions.
Okay. Um, are there any questions? I'll put this in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was, I mean, it's beautiful spectra. You have a uh, tall B. So I was wondering, what's the prospects of getting methane spectra since that seems like it should be the hardest constraint? That's and, true. And I have a second question while, while I have a so word. Let me answer the first one. Yeah. So we <laughs> might actually have some constraints on the methane because we have uh, bluer spectrum. You might have seen the blue part of the extension that actually covers methane bands. Yeah. Uh, so we actually might have an upper limit on methane that's also relevant for the CO question. That's something we haven't looked into. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And, and my second one is just you mentioned, uh, of course, that carbon and oxygen are two elements, but there are many more mm -hmm. that might constrain the composition and where it can form. So which ones do you think are next on the list that you can get constraints from? So uh, right now we're pretty limited to this wavelength range that WIPC3 covers. Uh, it turns out if you look at some colder transiting planets, uh, you might actually see uh, ammonia absorption. So that would give you access to nitrogen mm -hmm. chemistry. Uh, that's going to be hard, though, because in transmission you're, you're potentially affected by clouds, and I have a feeling that clouds are going to be very common around colder transiting planets. I look forward to the James Webb Space Telescope in particular because we'll be able to do emission spectroscopy of colder planets and have a wide range of, of molecules that we'll have access to. So, I mean, C and O are the obvious uh, elements that we'd like to get, uh, and then who knows after that. Uh, yeah. So I, I may have missed something about GJ1214b. So you said that the um, featureless um, spectrum that you see is indicative of clouds um, high up in the atmosphere. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, why, why is it not possible that the atmosphere has completely been photo evaporated and there is no atmosphere? Right. So there are two parts to that. One is that uh, we know that a planet must contain a large component of volatiles simply by its density. And so given its temperature, it's you know it's hard to imagine a, a volatile-rich object not having some sort of atmosphere that's outgassed or sublimated. Also, the planet is even larger than all the models for 100% solid composition predict. So that suggests that it must have a gas layer of some sort. Um, I would say that's less certain than this volatile argument because certainly the planet has volatiles. It depends on how well you trust the models with that uh, that inference about definitely having an atmosphere. But it definitely has volatiles. We know the temperature roughly. It's hard to imagine it not having an atmosphere. So how does TESS tie into all of this and what and on what time scale? Yeah, TESS is going to be really critical. So TESS is selected for launch in 2017. And so that ties into the GMT and JWST time scale, which is a little bit later in the decade as well. So it's a perfect time to find those planets. So TESS will find transiting planets. Uh, they'll just be candidates. So you'll have to go through a process of validating those as true planets, confirming them as planets, measuring their masses, and, and knowing what kind of planet that you're looking at. Because the atmospheric characterization takes a lot of investment of telescope time, so you want to be sure, you want to be choosy how you're picking those planets. Uh, but TESS is really critical. It should find uh, transiting planets, Earth-sized planets, in the habitable zones of M dwarfs. If we can measure the masses of, of those objects, then we can take those objects and study them with the next generation of, of, of telescopes. Um, you said a bit in the middle about temperature inversions. I maybe just missed this. What do temperature inversions actually tell us? Why should we be excited about whether there are them or not? And also, what then changed going from the new scene paper you showed points from to your reanalysis? What changed to make that point that was changing? Right. So the question of the question of thermal structure, you know, broadly speaking, is a question of one of just planetary atmospheric physics. Specifically for thermal inversions. There has to be, uh, those weren't really predicted ahead of time. So there has to be some unusual chemistry happening in the upper part of the atmosphere to cause, to cause it to be heated. So it's really just a fundamental question about understanding the physics and chemistry of atmospheres to understand these thermal structures. What changed was uh, two things. Uh, the reanalysis of the old data changed the points that were originally published. And that's based on a deeper understanding and a deeper uh, grasp of how to correct instrument systematics. That's one thing I've kind of put under the hood of all these beautiful slides, beautiful, right? Uh, or that, where that there's a lot of uh, 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 instrument systematics that we have to correct to go from raw data to nice spectra. Uh, and so our ability to correct for those, we think we understand the instrument better and how to, for example, map the intrapixel sensitivity variations, if that's something that makes sense to you. There have also been new observations that are uh, taken with a better observing mode, more efficient observing mode, more stable observing mode. And so those new observations also agree with our reanalysis of the old data and push it to higher precision because it's a, it's a better data set. 
Uh, Zach. So, Jacob, it was super exciting in your observations of WASP 43 um, to see that you've got the same water abundances in transmission and in emission. So, like from the day side and from the Termin or the Terminator. Um, and so we've always like waved our hands and said there's no reason that should necessarily be the case, that you would have the same composition of these different parts of the <coughs> atmosphere. Um, but now that you have seen that, um, and have you gone the extra step to ask to say, uh, well, if the atmosphere is well mixed and I have the same composition everywhere, can I place limits on the presence of clouds in the planet's atmosphere on the basis of the fact that I do measure the same thing? So we did include clouds in our uh, modeling of the water, the WASP 43b transmission spectrum, okay. and we constrained the altitude of the clouds to be below the observable atmosphere. Um, if there's there's probably more theoretical work that you could do, uh, although I haven't thought much about that. But we always include clouds when we model transmission spectra, of course, because. That's kind of turned into my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One comment and one question. Sure. The comment was those changes in the reanalysis were up to a factor of 10. Yeah, very which statistic, yeah. really amazed me. Right. But my question concerns <clears throat> the correct distinction between habitable and inhabited. Sure. <laughs> what I was curious about. Is what criteria are you going to use to decide on inhabitants? You're coming to dinner, right? So we'll have some beers. I mean, I, I take a, I guess I take a very agnostic point of view that I like the astronomer's definition of habitable zone planet, something that could conceivably have liquid water, and then we'll just try to answer this empirically. We want to know this. We want to know the atmospheric composition. We want to use that to infer the surface temperature. If there is a surface on the planet, whether you can have liquid water, we want to ultimately measure the presence of biomarkers and understand those in the context of, of chemistry and geophysical processes and all that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think there's going to be one definition, I think, is the answer to your question. It's going to take a very complete, comprehensive study of a lot of different issues all coming together um, to answer the question of habitability and inhabitability. So, how could you learn more about the clouds and you get about 14 deep? What would be the observation? Yeah, so as I said earlier, I'm excited about thermal emission measurements in the long run with JWST. Because those will give you the temperature, right? Where they come Those will give you the temperature and they're also less sensitive to the clouds, so that allow you, you know, presumably you would see molecular absorption features. Then that would start to tell you about the bulk composition of the atmosphere, which we simply don't know right now. Uh, and, and that would help constrain what sort of clouds could be forming. You could also be affected by clouds in thermal emission measurements. I mean, the effect is less because you have this normal viewing geometry compared to the slant viewing geometry of transits. Um, but that should, you know, that should really blow the door open on this stuff. Won't necessarily answer the question, but it really should advance this a lot if you can make thermal emission measurements. Yeah. Thanks. Do you observe the daytime emission spectrum from the GJ2014? Uh, because I think that the overall or the reflective may reflect the composition of may st further support. Your yeah, so it's 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 not really possible with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope given the short wavelength coverage of that. There's been an intensive observational campaign to so look for the thermal emission of GJ1214b using Spitzer at infrared wavelengths, longer infrared wavelengths, uh, and all they have is an upper limit at this point. Uh, it's a very, it must be a very small signal. The planet's equilibrium temperature is about 500 Kelvin. And just to give you a point of reference, there have been no thermal emission detections for any exoplanet cooler than about 1,000 Kelvin to date. So it's a big stretch. Up here? Oh, excellent. Um, have you considered time dependence of either the thermal inversion or the cloud cover to explain why maybe fluxes might be changing as much as the time? Uh, I haven't considered that. Um, I think from the theoretical point of view, the time variability is not expected to be very large. Uh, that doesn't mean that those theoretical predictions are correct, but as an observer, uh, my usual point of view is that perhaps uh, the observations are not accurate. Uh, and so <laughs> that's, that's usually my go-to explanation for these sort of weird effects. And, um, I'd be happy to be proven wrong with really precise data that's demonstrated to be repeatable, but um, until then, I try to do more observations. Okay. Yes, please. Um, so your data seems to suggest that the carbon oxygen ratio of WASP-12 is 
not so solar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, what do you have any thoughts on what might be the explanation for the lack of the inversion layer that you'd expect? Oh, with the thermal inversion. Mm -hmm. Well, there. Um, th that's so. That's a possibility that could um, connect the thermal emission measurements and the transmission measurements because the tr the, the thermal emission day side emission does suggest a high carbon dioxide ratio. It's very hard to explain this one Spitzer photometric point, which is actually based on four repeated observations uh, being where it is. Um, what you could have is some weird thing going on with the temperature pressure profile. And indeed, if you have this black body, then what you've got is a very super hot uh, substellar point on the planet. Well, Australia is quite hot. That's dominated in the thermal emission when you see the day side. So I say day side, and that implies that you're seeing the whole hemisphere. And you are seeing the whole hemisphere. But it goes as t to the four, right? So if one spot is much harder than the rest, and that's going to dominate the emission spectrum. And you could be seeing an isothermal part of that atmosphere uh, there. If you if you have that, then maybe you need to invoke some sort of absorption to cause that isothermal. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling. Uh, it's, <laughs> the jury's out. The jury's out. Sorry. Well, it's uh, been so good to see you all again <laughs> and to uh, see your continued and ever-growing interest in exoplanets. Uh, and please join me in thanking uh, Jacob. <laughs>